So, Seamus, I hear there's some kind of celebration in the United States these days. Yeah! Yay! We just had Thanksgiving! Yay! This was a big one for us. Um, you remember, you might remember a few years ago, I did a post about visiting Texas. Yeah, yeah, I drove down there for a few days or a week or something. That was the last time I saw my oldest two kids, and I just said goodbye to them about an hour ago. They're on their way back to Texas. That's how long it, it's been since the last time I saw my kids. Wow. So, sad time to say goodbye to them, but uh, it was really good to see them again. Yeah, people who live in, in other countries don't... It's kind of hard to realize how big the United States is. Like, each of our states is like a whole other country. Yeah. Yeah, it's just enormous how far away my kids are. And it made me sad. Didn't get to see them for so long. They might be moving north again. We'll see. They'd only be five hours. They'd only be like five hours away. So they'd be like a Germany away if if they moved north again. <laughs> Instead of being an entire Europe away, they'd be just like a Germany. Yeah, right now, if you were in, like, I don't know, Chernobyl, they'd be all the way over in Gibraltar or something. Right, it's crazy. And Texas, oh, they live just in the middle of nowhere in Texas, so that makes it extra hard. Right, you can't even fly yeah. there. Right, even if you decide, okay, I don't want to be in Texas anymore, you've got to go a long way to stop being in Texas. Well, so they came up and visited. Had any of the other family get together, or has COVID kind of put a damper on the sociality? Yeah, COVID did kind of put a damper on things. We normally would have had visits or gone and visited a larger number of people, but I get to see my my two oldest two kids and their families. But you know, I didn't get to see the extended family of aunts, uncles, cousins, and so on and so forth to the nth degree. Everybody pretty much stayed home. We had a, we got takeout. <laughs> we had a fun, you know, you know, normally everybody has, you know, the turkey and everything. We got takeout. Um, we just weren't in a position to cook a great big meal. And I was like, you know what? This is pretty freaking awesome. We did <laughs> no dishes Chinese afterward. Right. There was no dishes and people didn't need to spend the entire day cooking. It was just, and it, you know, they we actually got Chinese takeout and it was just, I don't know, they brought food back, we ate, and then it was done and we were done worrying about it. So that's our new... Yeah, I think this, for that. Yeah, I, mean, I think this is our new, our new tradition is... Chinese. I don't know if it'll be Chinese, but I think it's takeout from now on. <laughs> Thankful for takeout. Thankful that we didn't have to cook this year. So how was your holiday? You happy? Yeah, I had a good time. I My uh, my wife, uh, all of her parents and siblings are in town. Like they, they live here and my parents and most of my siblings live here as well. And so we always do like early Thanksgiving dinner slash lunch with her family and then like late dinner slash dessert with my family and uh so it's always just like wall to wall thanksgiving for a day and then we did like a, a camp over where like all the dads and kids pitched tents in the backyard of my parents house and did like nice. sleep over time and so that was like okay i got you know six hours of sleep maybe on like hard ground because we didn't have any ground pads because none of us are prepared because it's just like you know we we're just gonna go and camp out or whatever and so it's like oh didn't sleep at all hardly and uh then in the morning we had spent the previous day we went out and got a bunch of cardboard boxes and we built like cardboard box castle and uh so then we we're like out in the sun getting sunburned because it's southern california is all sunny out and windy and the boxes are all getting blown over in the wind and so it's just like two days of of non-stop social stuff and i am so socialed out right now <laughs> you know we actually were kind of lucky in that a lot of the people that visited were themselves introverts so there was a lot of everybody talking and this really animated conversation and then after about an hour it's like just 
just a few of the hardcore talkers and everybody else is retreated to the corners of the room to poke their phones, right? Yeah. And, uh, I, but I have my home office that I could retreat to. That's There really you go, nice. your fortress of solitude. Right. It's nice. Come in here. It's dark. No one else wants to be in here. Everybody thinks this is in a used room. They're like, oh, there's no lights on in here. Clearly nobody's in here. <laughs> Meanwhile, I, I'm just, I'm just surfing the internet to the glow of my rainbow keyboard. Oh, good. You get any computer games done at, in between visiting with people? I did. I actually got a lot of gaming done this week, strangely enough. I, uh, I hope nobody's irritated at me. I kind of like played hooky from the site for most of the week just to spend time with my family. So, um, I just caught up on the threads on the site. It looked like I got away with it. I'd feel really bad if there'd been a flame war that got out of control and I let it burn for a day and a half or something, but eh, it's, uh, it's cool. Um, I played a game called, the Steam sale came, so I started buying games like crazy, and I got the game called Carrion. Have you heard of this? I have not. All right, the premise is, it's, it's a 2D side-scroller, and if you've seen, like, classic 80s sci-fi horror, like The Thing, um, where it's okay. a bunch of people in a Rubber science and stuff. It's a bunch of people in a science military outpost type thing. And it's a horror game where th this creature escapes containment and begins hunting down the staff and devouring them and uh, growing larger and larger and just crawling through the vents and... and, um, and helping other parts of itself break containment so it becomes more and more powerful and evolves more and more power and you play as the creature Ooh. Yeah, it's a reverse horror game and oh my goodness I love this game so much so, um, let's see the reverse of horror is like empowerment is it an empowerment fantasy I guess I mean, there are some spots where you'll get run into people in, like, armored suit. You can't eat them. Like, most people, if you just find a scientist, you can just chomp them down and you'll get a little bit bigger. But there are guys that can't be eaten. Um, you can chew them up to kill them, but you spit them back out. They're, like, inedible mm. because of the suit they're wearing. And they have, like, a flamethrower. And flamethrowers are terrifying because not only do they do massive damage but you keep burning until you can douse yourself and you're this you are a very you're just this giant creature of tentacles and meat just this big tentacle <laughs> beast with eyes all over it you can move very very quickly um but once you catch fire you really got to find some water and douse yourself as quickly as possible so playing tag with the flamethrower guys is always really dicey um you know the 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 classic trick is crawl around through the vents hope they don't see you get above them and roar you have a button to roar they all look towards the sound then you duck around and like you know, come out the floor behind them while they're still staring at where you were a second ago and nab just one of them and yank him under the floor and run away with him. Oh, the horror movie thing. Yeah, and uh, that's like that thing that happens in the horror movie is your strat. You pull him down in there and then you chew him up and, it, you know, he, he's got a suit on, you can't eat him, but it'll show your character, you know, like... Like a dog with that caught something and is whipping it back and forth in their mouth to sort of break it <laughs> and then spit <laughs> wow. it out. Yeah, it's really cool. I beat the game. I just, I beat this game and for the first time in ages, as soon as I beat it, I hit the new game button and started over. I just, this was so much fun. Uh, wow, gets, that's great. Yeah, I so it, I assume there isn't like a whole lot of tutorial because it just plays on the tropes of a horror movie where it's like you know what to do. Uh, there actually is. You have several powers that you unlock. There's like, you know, this glass containment thing, and you'll get into that room, which is hard to get into, 
shatter the glass, and then you kind of merge with whatever's in there, and you'll gain some new power, and it'll give you a situation where you can use that power. Like, oh, um, another problem you have is you have to manage your size. You have, there are certain powers that you only have access to when you're small, and certain that you only have access to when you're big. Like, uh -huh. oh, when I'm really big, I can smash through these, you know, makeshift wood barriers or whatever. But when I'm small, I can turn invisible. So you kind of manage your, your size. And there, you know, you'll find this pool where you can deposit some of your biomass to change your size. Or oh, okay. if you're just... And then get it back if you need it back or whatever. Right, exactly. If you're feeling daring, then just, you know, go and let some people shoot you a few times to get you down to size. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So as the game goes on, your top size gets bigger and bigger and you get more and more abilities to manipulate your environment and trick people and kill them. So there is quite a bit. It keeps you guessing in the me My one gripe about the game is I was always lost. <laughs> The map is gargantuan. I mean, it felt like I, I was just always just dizzy with, okay, well, where am I now? It's this big, Is this you know, a proc gen game where the map changes every run, or no, is it a preset, pre-built level? Pre-built pre, pre level, although it's really, really big. Um, so presumably, if you played a lot, you would get a sense for the base and how it's built and where you, how you get to get right. from one place to another. Right, I did, somebody made a map, but the map is just so, it's just megabytes and megabytes. Like, <laughs> like one of those annoying images that won't really fit in a browser window properly. And you zoom way, way out <laughs> to see the whole thing. And it's it's kind of like, uh, it's got an overworld and then subworlds. Like there's, you know, the overworld and then within that are doors that you can breach and enter, you know. Oh, I'll enter the science complex or the... Or whatever, or the the military mm, base. Okay. So it isn't oh, like an I, open world thing where you could just like burrow through the ground and hole off somewhere or something. Right, right. You you're pretty you're pretty limited by your environment. You've got to like, you know, lots of elevator shafts and and um, vents to go through, and you can't really just travel freely in the main corridors until you've killed everybody. And then you can move really fast. You know, you just take the main the main hallway and you go super fast. Um, Neat. Boy, it was fun. Yeah, it was really fun. All my favorite thing is you if you can sneak up on a human, you get like, say, under the floor, and you see there, you know, there's a grate that they walk over. You can get a tentacle up and poke it into them and take control of the human and use them like your puppet. Wow. Yeah, and then you can like all the have horror that... movie tropes. Exactly, and then you can have that human. You know, you have to do this to solve some puzzles. Um, you know, it's like oh, to flip a switch, or oh, this room's filled with guys that, you know, three guys that can cover each other with flamethrowers. There's just no way you could kill them without just dying. But if I can get the one guy in the middle and have him shoot the other two <laughs> before they realize what's going on. <laughs> So is uh, it on like a on like a tendril or something? You can walk him around a bit, or is he like stuck above the grate? Oh uh, no, you can walk him out around quite a bit. The tendril has an implausible reach; <laughs> it just keeps <laughs> going. Uh, I haven't even like figured out what's what the maximum reach of that thing is, but yeah, you can do a lot, solve a lot of puzzles, get some stuff open, kill some people. This the the idea of the game and the mechanics and like having downside to getting bigger and like having trade offs and stuff all sounds really fascinating. Just looking at this game though, I don't think this is going to be a game for me. But I I like the idea of it and I'm glad someone made it. <laughs> yeah, it is it is a very clever and very charming game. Um, and yet my only complaint is I got lost too much and maybe that's my fault. Maybe maybe I'm just bad at navigating. The game world was just too big. Yeah, you know, you're having a good day when that's their, your main problem. Yeah. So speaking of games that are too big, 
Elite Dangerous. I have never yeah. played this, but I know it by reputation. So tell me about your time with Elite Dangerous. So Elite Dangerous uh, went on free on uh, Epic Game Store, uh, I think last week. And I was like, man, I, I know that this is like the... So there's the big three like open world spaceship games these days. There's um, Star Citizen, which never comes out. There's uh, No Man's Sky, which came out and everyone was sad about it. And then there's Elite Dangerous, which is supposed to be like the good one. Um, and I, I never played it and I would always kind of intended it. Well, no, that's not true. I played like 15 seconds of it when I was trying out one of my friends uh, has a, a VR headset and they had like the VR thing hooked up to Elite Dangerous somehow so that you could like sit in the cockpit and and it was quite it was quite something it was very cool um, but I never really played it I hadn't owned it so I got it last week and played it for I don't know maybe eight hours or so flying around and you know stayed up late and got got hooked into it and uh, and it was a good time nice so you beat it. Uh, well, uh, well, I I graduated from the tutorial zone, which is kind of like beating the game. I mean, if you think about it. But you've There's seen the a, whole you've seen the whole universe now, right? Well, okay, so that's that's kind of the problem. That's kind of the problem, right? Like like in No Man's Sky. You, you visit one planet and like you explore it and you're like, wow, there's so much to see and there's so many things and so many different minerals and like this, it, this, the world is so unbounded and incredible. And then you go to the next planet and you're like, oh, this is the same kind of minerals and they, they have the same names and I'm collecting the same things and there's different shaped animals, but they do the same things. Like there's the flying ones, there's the ones that walk on the ground. And like you kind of see the pattern there, and you're like, okay, yep. I know this is all procedurally generated, but like the infinite expanse of the universe is, is kind of somewhat narrowed by having visited two planets. And then you visit like by the time you visit your tenth planet, you're like, I get it. Stop with the I know, I know. Just stop game. And I feel like Elite Dangerous kind of had that same kind of thing where like you're you start off the the beginning is quite good it's it's well done you start off in your in your spaceship and you're like sitting in the cockpit and the cockpit is just beautifully detailed there's control panels and, and little switches and lights everywhere and like you when you turn your view it brings up these other menus and and you can do them with num number keys and bring up the menus and like the interface is really slick and and uh, so it feels very real. It feels like, you know, this is like a real spaceship that someone made. You know how if you're like in Star Trek or something, it's like, oh, well, this is clearly like a movie set spaceship. But Elite Dangerous feels, or, or like uh, No Man's Sky, it feels like, you know, this a game spaceship where it's like, okay, well, there's like right. the control stick and the start button or whatever. Uh, it's very slimmed down and, and elegant and like, you know, minimal. Um, but Elite Dangerous, it feels like it feels lived in and there's all these controls and there's all these ancillary things and like little wires, you know, going places and it's not so gratuitous as like, uh, oh, the Space Ninja game. What was that? Space Ninja game. It's not coming to me. Nah, free MMO, um... You, you, we both played it a while back. It's free to play. Uh, you, you have it. Your, your space, your space ninja, your space samurai, and there's like all the, and everything looks like it's made of organic stuff. It's all made of meat. Oh, oh. Anyway, Warframe, Warframe. Yeah, that one. It's not, it's not gratuitously designed like Warframe, where everything looks like it's supposed to be stylized. It's more like, like if you imagine like a truck stop, like a space truck stop. And you're like a, a space truck driver or something. And there's like all these mechanically things that feels very, uh, very lived in. It's kind of Star Wars-y in that way. Oh, I like the sound of that. So, so like, it starts off there. You're in your cockpit and the guy's talking to you over the intercom. He's like, well, welcome, new pilot. And congratulations on getting a... a in the seat of the, your starship, you're going to be great someday, and we're just going to run you through some exercises to show that you know what you're doing, and then you'll be off to cruise the stars or whatever. And so you do this little thing where you fly through the course, and you shoot the drone, and you do targeting, and you do your controls and things. It's the tutorial. 
And, uh, and then he's like, all right, well, here you go. You can, I've given you a starter mission, but you don't have to do it. You can go wherever you want. And I was like, wow, this is great. And so you, you, you can bring up the menu and like buy stuff from the from the space station and there's all these goods and stuff. And then you'd say like auto launch and it, you know, automatically flies. And there's all these docks on the inside of the space station. There's like maybe like 20 little landing spots on, on this the inside of this circular thing. And you fly out and you can look back and there's that space station. And it's not just like a, a big old blank shape on the outside like uh like in no man's sky or something it's got all these lights and there's all these pipes and girders everywhere and there's little antennas sticking out and it's it feels alive and uh and like you're flying around and it's it's incredible and it's very it's a a great like first hour and a half but then like you fly to some other space station and that one's got landing pads on the outside and it's like oh cool i can land on the outside of this thing and then you land on um another one that's just like the one you started at and then there's like it turns out there's only maybe two or three different kinds of space stations and it just it all kind of it feels like you've seen everything after a while you go to a, a, a planet right. and you fly down to the planet but there's like nothing there except for the little the little colony and like there's no reason to land anywhere i don't know if you even can land anywhere else maybe you can maybe you can get out in a dune buggy or something but just like but why i don't know so so it just it felt kind of um it felt like this great experience that had been expanded far beyond its capacity to engage and uh and it kind of felt like the same thing that no man's sky did was where, where it had that that thing where it, it overstayed its welcome uh, and I don't know if that's just because I I am not engaged with it. I don't believe that it's real. And so, like, if I had I had really engaged with the the whole narrative of the thing, and there's like all this political intrigue stuff, and there's like news channels, and you can read about the political stuff, and then there's all this economic stuff. And my my sense is that like the politics and the economics interact. So if there's like a war going on, you can go and like take war supplies over there, or you can go over there and do missions to fight people. And so there's like a lot of a lot of stuff going on. But at the base level, it was like, okay, I can fly around and take cargo from one place to another. Um, or I can fly around and shoot guys. Uh, and, like, but there's no other... The, the mechanics weren't deep enough. It, it felt very wide. It was this really wide pool, but uh, but only a few inches deep. Interesting. I should probably try the game at some point. I've been watching footage as you've been talking about it, and it is very pretty. It looks, since I haven't played Star Citizen either, I could not tell the difference between Star Citizen footage and Elite Dangerous footage. Um, if I, I mean, I can tell because you know the video is named. Uh, oh, all ships reviewed quick, Elite Dangerous. But if it wasn't for that, I would not be able to tell you if the, which game this is footage is from. They're both photorealistic you know spaceship games to me right yeah they're so, both going uh, for that feel of like this is a real place where you're doing real things um and i guess the the main thing that felt weird to me about elite dangerous was that i never was able to get out of my spaceship cockpit like i was just stuck there like an x you know x beyond the frontier or x three or four or whatever um you're always just sitting in your spaceship cockpit and it never really feels like you're visiting these places. It feels like you're on a ride in Disneyland, right? And it's like, keep your arms and legs right. inside the vehicle at all times. Right. It kind of like the old, um, driving games where you couldn't get out of the car. So it feels like your character yeah. is a car. You don't feel like you're driving a car. You feel like you are a car. Right. Yeah. And you can pay to customize your, your character. Uh, and you can pay to customize your spaceship, uh, like real money pay, you know, things. So I guess it's like free to play and then pay for cosmetics. Um, I love just, the idea it's of, nice that it doesn't interfere with the mechanics. I love the idea of customizing your character that can't leave the ship and nobody can ever see. That's <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe you can at some point. I mean, maybe there's like a, a way to, I just, I never, like it never presented itself as an option. I, I pretty thoroughly explored the menus and stuff. Maybe you have to pay to be able to get out of your spaceship. I don't know. I, it just, it, it was like, the other weird thing about it was that 
I have this thing about, and I don't know, this isn't general to most people, but like for me, when I see something in a game, I want it to mean something, like mechanically. When I see all these lights on the spaceship, I want there to be rooms behind those lights. Right. When I see a, a space right. station and it's got like an advertising billboard on it, I want to be able to buy the thing on the billboard and I want to be able to put my advertisements on the billboard. I want to be able to like interact with the i want them i want it to be a, a game that is displaying things that matter not just things that are trying to convince me that this is real interesting so like eve online although but even more so yeah even more than eve online which is why i prefer games that have very simple visuals instead of things that are are uh, trying to look realistic. I want games that are, are giving me the visuals that tell me what I can do with the game, not visuals that are trying to make me think that I'm watching a movie, if that makes I sense. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is one of the really cool things about games like Minecraft or, or Teardown, where they have, like, real, uh, real in the sense of real mechanical objects portrayed where you can you can do stuff with them as opposed to just like right. you know it looks like it's real it's like no this is a real thing you can you can do something with you can interact with all these parts those mountains in the distance aren't a skybox you can go and you can dig in those mountains right i did watch a little bit of footage of teardown i know that was coming out was it this week or did it already come out it already came out. i think it was end of october oh okay wow it's been out for a month yeah I um I expected to be more busy. I I think I believed it was going to take me longer to get through Watch Dogs Legion. But that was a 2 week game. I kind of expected, "Oh, that's an open world city game. I'm going to be at that for months." But no, mm. I, I it was like week and a half and I finished my second playthrough and I'm like, "Okay. I've seen every and I had fun with it. I don't want to say the game is light on content. Um I had fun with it. And that was sort of the, t in fact, uh, Watch Dogs Legion was sort of the game, the, the sort of talking point game. Everybody would, if I was playing it, somebody would wander into the room to say something to me and then get distracted watching me play the game and end up sitting down and talking about the game with me. That happened multiple times. Hmm. Like, oh, oh, you mean you can be any of these, but like you could be that old, you could just, that old lady could join your team. Yep. Oh, wow. Uh, so that was, yeah, Watch Dogs Legion was the most interesting to watch. It was the, uh, the talking piece game of the last few weeks, but I am done with it. And so I moved on to Teardown. Are we going to get any articles on it or? I, I'm toying with the idea. I don't think it warrants like a full, like narrative write up. I think that would sort of be a little weird. That'd be like doing a narrative write up on on Minecraft like yeah you could do it <laughs> right but maybe you're missing the point of the game uh, on the other hand there are some really weird design choices in in Watch Dogs Legion that I think are worth talking about so we might get we might get like a medium-sized retrospective on it honestly the only thing making me hesitant is it feels like nobody played it on my site Nobody played it. Nobody's saying, yeah, I've been playing it too, and I've been having a good time. Everybody's like, oh, that game came out? Interesting. I remember seeing it at E3. I decided not to get it. <laughs> like, that's what everybody said. Oh, man. So I'm like, maybe reviewing the game is bad. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. The if you game, played the Watch Dogs Legion, leave a comment in the description. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I am curious, like, am I the only one that played this friggin' game? And of course, we are a week and a half away from uh, Cyberpunk 2077. It's happening. Yeah, everyone was expecting to be playing that by now. Right. But uh, they just... They just confirmed, yes, this is the real release date. We're not gonna... we're not gonna delay it again. This is happening for real this time. Mm. So, we'll see. So, what, what, what did you mention a few day, a few minutes ago? Oh, Teardown. Right. Right, Teardown. 
Um, for those who don't remember, I'll, I'll have some footage of Teardown or, or the or something in the show notes because it's one of those games where it makes a lot more sense when you can see it. But it's a voxel-based world, but not like Minecraft where you've got meter-sized uh, voxels. These are, I want to say, like two centimeter-sized <laughs> voxels, like much more granular. And the whole world is made out of them, and the whole world can be manipulated, mostly destroyed. You can sledgehammer your way through walls. And it's very obviously like somebody made this technology because they thought it would be cool, but once they made it, and I, I can really sympathize with this, they made technology, it was way cool and very interesting, and then they were like, but how do I make a game with it? It's kind of like in Noida, where they're like, we made this pixel physics engine. I wonder if I can get anyone to play it as a game. Right, yes. It has that same feel to it. Where, well, we'll just make the, the engine itself. The mechanics of the engine will be the mechanics of the game. So, like, the premise of Teardown is usually like... Uh, the, the limitation of Teardown is that you, the maps are small. Um, a few acres is, I think, the, the maximum map size. And Because the number of voxels gets goes up by the cube of the dimension, right? Right, right. So it gets out of control quickly. So you run around this world, and most of the places you go are industrial in nature. And your goal will be like, oh, here's a fuse box. You've got to like turn on the fuse box, do something to the fuse box, and then go to the other side of the complex and open a vo and open the safe. But those two things, because of the security system, you have to do those 20 seconds apart from each other, or you'll never get in. But, you know, normally there are walls in the way. So you have to, you have to engineer a path for yourself punch holes and, you know, use your sledgehammer, put holes in things to to make it possible to clear that distance in in the time allowed. Uh, which is very mm. brute force, like, okay, this is a game where you can punch holes in anything, so that'll just be your goal in the game. Um, the game part of it is not great. But oh, the no. playing... Well, I mean, it's just very bare bones, like kind of searching for cool mechanics. But the engine itself is just a delight. So you go into sandbox mode and you just have fun. Like, I played with it for like two hours yesterday, just burning things down. Because <laughs> it has realistic, like if you set fire to the bottom of a telephone pole... It will burn, and eventually that middle part of the pole will break, and it'll fall over. And then the top of the telephone pole will be supported by the wires of the other two telephone poles, which will now be experiencing torque, because the one in the middle is falling over. And you can... That's great. Oh, uh, like, you set a building on fire, and the smoke will pool inside of it. And, you know, then punch a hole in the roof, and all the smoke begins escaping. So it's fire that spreads realistic and smoke physics and, you know, just regular physics. Um, and it's just amazing watching those three systems interact. It is a delight. That sounds fun. Yeah. I, I, I'm really hoping they can get something like that working in other games because that, that whole voxel physics thing is like... It's so close to being a like a universal sandbox game kind of thing. Right, right. You can even edit your own maps, but you have to use a separate program. Like, it's a free program, comes shipped with the game, but, like, it's not as good as having a built-in editor. Mm -hmm. and, and I was fiddling around with the map editor, and I was like, great, I'll just make a bunch of wood buildings, and I'm going to start a really big fire. But then I realized, oh, wait, I can't... You don't personally have a way... You can only start a fire with propane tanks. And the editor doesn't give you a way to add propane tanks to a level. So I could oh, no. spawn in this level, but I just have a sledgehammer. And in fact, it gives you a fire extinguisher. You can put fires out, but it doesn't give you a tool to create fire yourself. 
Oh no! So it's limited. It, it's clearly not the tool that they use to make the levels. Um, it might be, but it's um, yeah. There, there's obviously some more that goes to it because the designer can change the weather and and place objects around that you know have you know things like propane tanks or vehicles or whatever, which you cannot do. But yeah, I mean it's mm. early access, so this is this is a game. This is an idea for a game that's in development, and I mean this is really this is where you want early access. You know, get people talking and see where the fun is. You know, and see if you can find the fun in the mechanics. You know, if you were a ten-person right. team, right. it'd be fine. Your your team could handle it, hammer it out themselves. But if you're one person. Yeah, you really need, you want a bunch of voices kind of giving you guidance on what they found fun and interesting. Right, you got to get that feedback somehow. Right. So, uh, this is, you know, I don't want to say, I mean, I don't know that it's worth it right now because it is so limited. There's not a lot to be done with it, but it's definitely something that I'm going to come back to it in six months and see see what's happened with this idea. And hopefully it's evolved. Like there's a, you can spray paint stuff. Like you just spawn with a can of spray paint. And it's like, well, there's no point to it. And it doesn't even make things more flammable, which I think is a missed opportunity. But it's cool that you, <laughs> you can. can't light the spray on fire while you're spraying it or whatever. Right. And spraying into fire doesn't like, you know, it's not like spraying hairspray over a flame. Aw. Right. Uh, really, the, the game does not support my pyromaniac tendencies. That's what I'm looking for. I want to burn all the things down. Yeah, you can't do that in real life because people get upset. So you want a game where you can do that in the game. Right. So, oh, what's this in the show notes? For the king? What's this about? Yeah, I, I played two games. We, it's been two weeks since we had an episode, so I've played two games now. Try to get one game a week. For the king. Is it for the king of town? The KOT, oh man, that would be that would be a game for sure. Uh unfortunately, no, this is unrelated to Homestar Runner. This is a, a like an RPG. It's like a real minimal RPG. Okay. Um my brother actually got uh got me a copy. It was like it's on sale or something. It's like you should play this game, it's really fun. And so um I played for I think one round uh yesterday uh which lasted uh, one run was like maybe three hours um going from i don't know how close i was to being in the game but it felt like i was getting pretty close to to topping out um and it's 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 pretty good i i liked it a lot it's got um it's got some in obvious strategies that like the first play, there was the first playthrough, so I didn't know what I was doing. I kind of blundered around and stuff, and uh, made some mistakes. And I was like, "Oh, I see. I should have done this instead of that, or I should have done, you know, in this order instead of that order, or something." And um, it would have been kind of nice if it had, if it had given me some of that guidance, where like, you know, do this thing first. Um, but on the other hand, it is kind of open world. It's got a hex grid, uh, overworld map, and then you can do combat with things and. Uh, you've got up to three characters that you're you're playing with, but they all operate somewhat independently. So you can have them like going on parallel paths, or like split the party and all run off in different directions. And it's kind of a it's kind of an interesting uh, an interesting take on the RPG genre. And uh, I haven't, like I said, I only played the one round, so I don't know how much of it is is proc gen, but I think a lot of it is uh, procedurally generated because it felt pretty fill in the blank kind of quests, right? Like go over and kill this thing. And, uh, you know, it just generates a, a monster somewhere, that kind of stuff. Right. But, uh, it had very, very charming kind of, um, low poly graphics and, uh, interesting mechanics, the way they've got the, um, the weapons and your skills and stuff. Uh, I, I'm not going to go into all the details because there's a lot of, of course, RPG, right? There's lots of stats and numbers and things, but um, I liked how it, I liked how it handled it. And it was, it was pretty fun. Cool. Yeah, I'm looking at the trailer now, and it, 
I don't know what to relate it to. Like, this is not your typical, this is not Skyrim kind of RPG. It's very stats-based. Yeah. It's got the hex grid. Okay, there is a game, here I'm going to admit that I never played this. Heroes of Might and Magic. My brothers yeah. were obsessed with that game back in the 90s. They were like, Seamus, you, you have to play this game. They were absolutely bonkers for it. And I somehow missed it. But it seems to me it was turn-based, it was played on a grid, and it did that sort of, you know, you don't have just one adventurer, you have this army of stuff that you're planning, so your turn is sort of like all over the place. And maybe this is like that. Uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to map the trailer that I'm seeing with the gameplay I remember from the 90s. And it seems like those two things might fit together, like maybe this is something in that vein. But if not, then this... I have no idea where this is coming from. Yeah, you know, I did. It didn't occur to me, but it does. I didn't play Heroes of Mind and Magic either. I think they're up to like twelve now or something crazy. Um, but it it does kind of feel a little like that from what I recall of it. The other series that also goes up to like fourteen or whatever now is Final Fantasy. It felt like like Final Fantasy five or Final Fantasy six or something. With yeah, the, the combat. You've got a party. Yeah, the... and, yeah. Well, you're on a world map, but it's it's got more integration. Like, like the the characters on the world map, the way combat works is if you're within a certain number of squares of the enemy that you're attacking, it'll draw all the other enemy characters in to that combat, and it'll also draw all your party members into that combat within that that range. And so you can kind of be off, like separate, doing separate things but still all fight in the same battles together. So it's like this weird, the being separate on the world map isn't entirely being separate, but it's also not being exactly the same place either. It, it's got it's some fascinating connections it makes there. Huh. Yeah, so I don't know what to think of this, but it is super cute and I love hex grids. So that's really cool. Yeah, if you've got a, a spare day or whatever, and, uh, you know, I think it's like six bucks or something. It's not very expensive. Um, the One of the mechanics that I wasn't quite sure what to think of is that while you're playing, you collect lore. They're like these books of lore. And it, there's nothing actually in them. Like, it's just, it's a currency. But it's a metagame currency where between runs, you can go to the lore store and unlock uh, locations, I guess, that appear in your next run. And so, like, after I finished my run, I went to the lore thing and unlocked, like, some of the stuff and some of the stuff I had keys for in my run, but like there were no locations to go to. So it was like, here's right. a ticket to the the parade of, of fantasy. And like, there is no parade of fantasy. Well, I hadn't unlocked it yet. So it was this weird thing where it's like, I don't know. I, it, and I'm, I'm not certain that, that that feels fair yet. Like I, I just haven't played. I need to play another couple rounds, I guess, but it feels kind of unfair to be like, you might need these locations in order, like one of them is the, so one of them is like the, the altar, like the, the Kraken pylon or something. And like you activate it and it keeps the Kraken away from you. It's like, well, what is the Kraken? You don't know, but I know because I ran into the Kraken in my first run through. And there was like, so normally, so you've got character levels basically, you know, and you're like level right. four or five and you go to a dungeon that's level four or five and you're, it's about a fair match and you go to level six dungeon and you're level four or five and you're pretty much going to die. Like you really have to be up to level. Um, and so I was level four or five. I was sailing around. I just bought a boat and you know, it's like, Oh cool. And now I can do the, the sailboat thing. And, uh, I found like a location and you go to the locations like it could be anything. What is it? There's these little question marks and you can go explore them. And usually they're like a fountain to give you more health or like maybe a little chest with some loot in it. Or uh, or sometimes it's like a mimic and you, you know, you think it's a chest, but it's actually an enemy and they do a little combat. So I went to this thing and it's like the mighty Kraken level eight. And I was like, ah, ha ha. You know, my characters have like, you know, 50 health and the Kraken has 300 health and and it's got two tentacles, and each of those have like 180 health. And I was like, I, I'm gonna die here. Like, what am I supposed to right. do against this thing? And uh, so then, like, I un after that run was over, I, I got it destroyed my ship, and I got washed up on shore. And so it was like it wasn't the end of the game, but it was the end of that boat. And uh, so then, like, I unlocked the Kraken thing. It's like you know, it keeps the Kraken away on a large radius. I was like, well, golly, that would have been really handy to have, wouldn't it, game? Right. Right. 
so I, I get the feeling that maybe there's a lot of stuff like that where like if I get later on to the late game, I almost get to the end boss or something and there's going to be some sort of crazy gotcha thing and then I'm going to go back to the lore store and it's be like, oh, here's the thing to solve the problem that you encountered. It's like, well, yeah, okay. But like, it doesn't feel like I could have beat the game. Well, I mean, maybe if I was really good at it, I could have beat the game like from square one without unlocking any of the lore locations. But it feels kind of like this meta level up thing where my whole game is leveling up so that when I do new runs, I'll be more capable in, in doing those runs. And I understand right. from one perspective, like, you don't want to unload a ton of mechanics on the player right at the very beginning. You want to keep it, you know, simple so that they can handle it. But there's a lot of mechanics already. You know, open your stats thing and there's like eight stats and like all these skills and then all these abilities and like tons of stuff. So it's not like they were keeping all the complexity out. It was just like... There's all this added complexity, and I don't even know how much more complicated it is. So anyway, it it's cool, and I like they do it. And they, they do lampshade at the beginning. Like, when you start your first run, there's this little dialogue that's like, many have failed before you, and don't be afraid to fail now, because there's always something to learn, and, you know, you'll be able to advance in your quest, even if you fail in this run or something. And so I was like, okay, that, you know, fair enough. It, it warned me in advance that probably I wasn't going to be able to do it on my first run, but it still feels, I don't know, like the magic circle that you draw around that run feels like it's kind of uh should have a little bit more firm boundaries than than that so i don't know maybe keep the kraken out of the hey game designers maybe keep the kraken out of the run when i don't have the pylon that keeps the kraken away yeah how about that or don't right. give me a ticket for the night fair when the night fair isn't ever going to show up it does feel like here's a problem and here's a solution, and they're one-to-one. -one. It's not like, oh, we need more bonuses for our for our sea combat, for fighting on the high seas, and eventually we'll, we'll get good enough ships to beat the Kraken in one of these runs. It's, oh, if we don't want to die to the Kraken, we need the anti-Kraken thing unlocked, and if we don't want to die to the dragon, we need the dragon thing unlocked. And, yeah, it just sort of feels like artificial unlocks for the sake of more unlocks, rather than systems that right interact. yeah yeah that that's yeah that's kind of what was bothering me i think i'm glad we had this talk <laughs> so we got w weeks ago we got two different emails from people asking me what i thought of hades on steam and it just occurred to me uh rather than not answer them i'll just say i've never played it i it's probably not going to be played soon my plate is very full so I thought it was interesting two different people asked about this game specifically. So you haven't but played Hades? Have not played. Because that's also kind of a, a multi-run with extra run currency. Like like you can do runs of Hades and like to try to escape or whatever, but like between runs you can get things that power you up or like give you different abilities to become more powerful so you can get through more of the run. It feel like it's kind of a similar kind of feel to For the King, or, or at least from what level I've seen of it. Let's do one mailbag and call it a show. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Take this. Take this one. Dear Diecast, I was recently listening to a podcast interview on Tested.com with Adam Savage, speaking with guest Evan Narcisse. Narcisse. Nars sorry. Sorry, even Evan. I don't even. Uh, your, both your first name and your last name are a mystery. Read the read the thing in the description if you want to know how his name is spelled. Who, if you are unfamiliar, is slash was a reporter for Kotaku, but also is the writer on a regular, on a recent Black Panther comic miniseries. Wow. In the interview, he discusses adapting to writing for an unnamed video game and how it's like trying to put a saddle on a hurricane in that things keep changing around with the design. It has me wondering if the sort of fluidity is the source of some of your incongruities and shortcomings that you love so, so love to point out in your breakdowns of games like Spider-Man. And here's a link to the uh, Tested.com interview. Your fan, Amstrad. Thank you for the question, Amstrad. So yeah, this is not the first time I've heard this complaint, which is like... Oh, yeah, we had a plan, but then, like, while the game... We were making the story while we were making the game. And by the time we were done, we had a completely different story. <laughs> and a completely different game. Right. And this is apparently very common. 
and it's certainly a contributor to to the overall problem of why are video game stories so terrible. And I'm not sure, like, they're terrible. So why, why do they keep getting changed? Were they even worse to begin with? <laughs> Did you start with a terrible story and then as the game took shape, you managed to to gradually shape it into something that's just really dumb. Um, why? I think some of this, my current theory for a lot of this, is that companies just want to make games too fast. They want a game every 18 months. And it's very, very hard to make an entire game, you know, to come up with the gameplay and the story and the artwork and the environments and get all the technology working if you're working on all of those things at the same time. Yeah. Like, um, you know, in Valve games, they usually do gray box building. You, you know, I, I don't think that, I, I don't know that they call it gray box, but I mean, I've heard other industry people talk about, you know, you build a level, but you don't worry about how it looks. You worry about functionality. Okay, here is a play area and then we're going to break line of sight and have you move into this next play area where a thing where a different type of gameplay will happen and then the, you will again break line of sight and go into maybe a puzzle type section right but you don't yeah, yeah. make it you don't make it pretty you don't like spend hours texturing and lighting it and and putting in this cut scene here that's going to explain all this stuff and then you know somebody changes something and you have to redo everything. And when your game is being judged by non-gaming idiots, let's say you work at EA, and they don't... You can't just put the controller in their hands and have um, Andrew Wilson go, Oh yeah, this feels pretty good, or this feels a lot like Dark Souls, or this feels a lot like Prince of Persia. He wants to sit there and look at it and go, yes, these visuals are good enough. Right. And so you, you're kind of trying to build something that's always the maximum level of polish. And so all the things or that you've would got normally... parallel lines of development where one guy's working, one team is working on the gameplay and one team is working on the visual look and one team's working on the story and they're not talking to each other because they can't be talking to each other because they've both they've all got their jobs to do right and if if it was slower instead of a hundred people making the game in 18 months how about you have 50 people make it in eight in three years that it would have more time for you know get the foundation built it's like you're trying to build the roof of the house while you're also digging the foundation trying to build everything at once and it would be nice is if you could just build it from the bottom up yeah yeah or or even that, worse you're trying to build the foundation and the roof and also the architect keeps redrawing the plans right and it would be nice if you could build the foundational stuff first and you get that all worked out and you, you know, and then you start making beautiful environments once you know how they're going to work. And and it's not as big a deal because you're not paying 100 people every month. You're paying 50 people every month. And so, you know, um, and so you have less friction between team members also. You know, the more people you add, the more hour, the more percentage of hours get lost to things like meetings and, and whatever and memos and yeah. communication. I think one of the, and having not worked in the games industry really, uh, I this is just conjecture, but I feel like part of the problem is that when you are making a, um, a movie, your basic unit of, uh, before you've started working on anything else, your basic unit is the, the script, like the story. Right. What story we are we so telling here? Right, we have so many pages of script. Yeah, and and well, and and you want to know, you want that to be pretty well nailed down. You want to know what's your script, what's the story we're telling, and then everything is built on that. The visuals are built on the themes in the story, and the all the actors are built on the kind of characters in the story, 
and all the set design and all the locations that you're going to scout out and there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done and if you just suddenly change the script like you've got all this set design and, and locations and costuming for Inception and then you're like actually it's going to be Boondock Saints and like oh uh mm, <laughs> right we we're right. not gonna I mean it might still look amazing but it's not going to be correct like it, it's we're going to have to do a lot of stuff over right and for a game like you were saying the the basic unit of a game is the the gray box prototype the just the bare bones gameplay like is this interesting gameplay is this what kind of a what kind of interactions are the players having what kind of agency do the players have the story is something that's built on that it's not something that that grows you know, in tandem with it or or creates the gameplay the gameplay is the fundamental unit and so when writers come from another medium like comic books or, or something uh into game they feel like oh well i should be doing my story and then everyone else gets to build on it and i can inform everyone about what is happening in the story they're going to come to me and ask me what kind of things fit or don't fit how it's supposed to look uh when and and maybe that's how the company is run because people are used to, in other mediums to working that way but right for making a game you have to go to the people who have who really understand the mechanics you have to go to whoever it is the game designer or the programmer someone's got their got you know up to their neck in the mechanics of the how the game works in this prototype that they've built and that's the guy who needs to say what it's supposed to look like and what it's supposed to feel like and what you know what kind of interactions are appropriate and what kind of story is going to work well or not work well with it and so a writer coming from another medium is going to come in with their idea of like i'm the the cornerstone of this game and it's not going to work because they aren't like in a game the story isn't the cornerstone right yeah yeah especially if you're coming from comic books the the inker doesn't start drawing crap until he knows what your story is <laughs> oh yeah just draw right. some stuff i'll let you know what the story is going to be about next week just but start just drawing draw some it cool now. characters yeah yeah I mean, right. maybe some neat explosions and guys punching each other i'm sure there'll be some punching Right. Well, we'll we'll fit it all together later, and that's kind of <laughs> how people try to build video games, and it's crazy. But if you got the game to the point where, okay, we know what the gameplay. If you got, okay, here's how environments need to work. Here's how the tools need to work. If you got to the point where, once again, the story could be the baseline that you're working from then you could start with the story and you know build up from there but yeah if you had a, a well working uh engine or something and you were doing something that was pretty well defined like a first person shooter story driven uh right. you know military kind of game then yeah you could you could probably pro um conceivably and and productively start with the story i'm not saying that that there's no way to do it it's just that's not like the core of a game design isn't the story anymore right <laughs> yeah you don't like uh, pick a story and then figure out what kind of game is this going to be a platformer or a shooter i was kind of thinking it might be an open world crafting game or maybe like a minecraft i don't know we haven't picked the mechanics yet <laughs> it's like you, you kind of have you you pick that first and then you write the story on top of that but like you said that means that the story is not the ba the foundation And yes, I can imagine I'm, it being I'm very frustrating for writers and other mediums to like come in and try to work in that environment. It sounds like this. I haven't I haven't listened to the uh, the interview, but it sounds like this person ran into those very problems. Yeah, especially the put a saddle on a hurricane, and it's like wow, it's just total upheaval. I I have heard about a few recently that I can't talk about about just baffling design decisions. Um, on various games that's like oh, oh, the need to have a giant team working on everything at once makes everything so much harder and I feel like we lost something by scaling up to the AAA size and if anything I, I think it was Ubisoft began bragging that they were going for quad A like we want to build games even bigger 
And I'm thinking we need to do the opposite. <laughs> we need to go smaller. We need more controlled, contained experiences, you know, where people know what they're doing and what they're building. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I anytime I hear someone bragging about their production value, I just want to bring up the sales chart for Minecraft. Right? Minecraft, World of Warcraft. In fact, I, I'll bet the biggest games of all time, I mean, it's like, what are the biggest ones? It's going to be Minecraft, World of Warcraft, Mario. All of those are stylized and not, you know, photorealism first. Yeah. So... Yeah, that's my that's my suggestion for this. I mean, I'm going to just continue to pick apart stories because, oh, you made me sit through it. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't pick apart the story, but you made me sit through this cutscene instead of letting me play my video game. And I didn't think your cutscene was very good. You're not going to criticize the story in Teardown because they didn't, they didn't right? make you sit through a story. Yeah, you didn't take my sledgehammer away while... <laughs> Mr. Anti Teardown, Mr. Well, Bob the Builder cackles over me and like takes my sledgehammer away and talks about how much he's going to build a giant fireproof place that I'll never be able to break into. And I've got to sit through five minutes of that. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Fix it, Felix shows up. Right? <laughs> As the bad guy. Oh, well. So. Thank you to everybody. There are more questions here, but I think they need to wait for another podcast. Thank you to everyone who sent in questions. If you've got a question for the show, the email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. So that's it. Any final thoughts, Paul? I, I'm glad that we came full circle on, uh, on AAA stuff and movies because we came right back to carry in. It's like... It looks just like a movie, but not because it had to be a movie, but because the movie had to be a game. That's a really good way of thinking of it. Thanks for listening, everybody. See ya! So, for the last two days, I've just been making jokes in my head about carrion. Carrion luggage. Carrion, my wayward son. Just... I can't stop. I can't stop. It's stupid. I won't turn this game into a fun.